thank you. I'll tell you what, these crazy kids, I tell you, man, it's so good to be with you this morning. Thank you, Joey, for allowing me the opportunity. Appreciate that. Man, I'm a mess. I'm a mess. Thank you, Rob. I'm glad that you're called to lead us in worship and lead us to that point. Man, I am all hyped up on Jesus, and I've had two energy drinks. (laughs) You don't know what you're in store for. If I start talking fast, just listen faster, okay? I consider it a privilege to open God's word with you, and so I'm excited for what God has in store for us today. I'm going to be pacing all over the stage, and I just apologize to all the people who are manning the cameras. Um, It's been a great week. Uh, I was with these students this past week at camp, and God did some amazing things. And uh, it's truly amazing to see a group of students who stand um, and worship the Lord and uh, have made some awesome commitments. God has changed some of their lives for eternity's sake, and man, I'm excited to see what God's going to do in and through them in the very near future. So I'm super pumped for them, and I'm excited to be here with you this morning. This morning, I'm going to be looking at the story of Elijah. Titled today's mess, today, this morning's message, I told you it's energy drinks talking, I'm sorry, a showdown at Mount Carmel, and uh, we'll get there in a minute. A couple, a few weeks ago, I'm, my daughter was sitting on the couch reading a, a book, and, uh, and she looked at me and she said, Daddy, were you born when the telephone was invented? <laughs> I, love, I love questions like that. And I said, um, no, baby, the telephone was invented a few years before uh, I, you know, I came around. But I will tell you that it was while I was in high school that the internet was invented. And her jaw hit the floor, and she looked at me like I'd come from some ancient civilization that hadn't invented like an alphabet yet. I mean, it was unbelievable. So I find it important to kind of get the context of this story. So uh, we're going to go back a few years uh, to... Uh, the nation of Israel. And we see the nation coming to this point, and we're not going to go all the way back to the beginning, but uh, there was a point in time where the nation of Israel, they're looking at the other kingdoms and the other societies around them, and they see that they have a king. Israel was ruled by judges and prophets. That's all they needed. But they cried out for a king. God, give us a king. So God gave him a king, and he gave him King Saul. In a few weeks, Pastor Joey is going to be going through the story of David and Goliath. And uh, it was Samuel who anointed David as the next king of Israel. And so after Saul came David. And then after David came his son Solomon, one of the wisest men in all the world. Solomon, as you read through the pages of scripture, um, maybe wasn't so wise. Uh, We read through the pages of scripture that Solomon had 300 wives, which meant he had 300 amazing, wonderful, awesome mother-in-laws. <laughs> Solomon started off really well, and uh, toward the end of his life, uh, began to take a little bit of a turn. Solomon had a son, Rehoboam. And Rehoboam was going to be coronated as the next king of Israel. And Rehoboam, while he was there in the holy city, is visited by a guy, a servant, Jeroboam. And Jeroboam comes to Rehoboam, I don't, these names aren't made up, they're real names, and says, listen, your father's yoke of heavy work was hard, was burdensome. And so please, as the next king, would you please lighten the load upon us? You can read about these in 1 Kings chapter 14, 15. And so Rehoboam, in his wisdom, goes to his advisors, his, his trusted advisors, and says, what shall I do? And they said, well, uh, Jeroboam says that if you will just relent a little bit from this hard work, that they will serve you with all of their heart. So his advisors tell Rehoboam, do it. Lighten their load so that you will have, uh, they will have your back and you will have their heart. So Rehoboam says, okay, but he's, he's a young guy, and so he's got some friends that he's put into some positions of power, and so he says to his friends, hey, what shall I do? 
They said, are you kidding me? You have more strength in your little finger than your dad had in his whole leg. The Bible says loins, but that just sounds a little bit weird. In his whole leg, you make their life harder. And that's what he went with. That's the advice that he listened to. And so he goes back to Jeroboam and says, sorry, pal, uh, it's gonna get worse. So Jeroboam and Rehoboam, they part ways. And here we have the divided kingdom, the 10 tribes to the north, the two tribes to the north, to the south. And we have this division now among the people of Israel, the northern tribes following Jeroboam. Jeroboam was, he had great intent. He, he feared the Lord. He feared Yahweh. He was leading the people to Yahweh, but he um, got a little fearful. He got a little frightened. He was afraid to make that journey to the holy city for fear that Rehoboam might take his life. And so instead of finding another good, God-honoring alternative, he made a couple of golden images and had the people of the 10 tribes that he ruled worship them. As we pick up in 1 Kings, we begin to see a pattern take place. I'm gonna start back in verse Uh, in chapter 15, I'm sorry, chapter, yeah, the end of chapter, first, chapter 15. It goes through the list of kings of Israel, the northern tribes. Nadab did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, followed the example of the sin he had caused Israel to commit. Verse 34, uh, King Basha, he did what was evil in the sight and followed the example of Jeroboam and the sin he had caused Israel to commit. Bashar rested with his fathers and was buried in Tizra. His son, Elah, became king. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him with the work of his hands. Zimri, because of the sin he committed by doing what was evil in the Lord's sight and by following the example of Jeroboam and the sin he caused Israel to commit. You see the pattern here of all the kings that followed Jeroboam have done evil in the sight of the Lord. Look at chapter 16, verse 25. Omri. If you're looking for a good name for a son, maybe Omri uh, is one of those names. But Omri did what's evil in the sight, and he did more evil than all who were before him. Israel's king Ahab, chapter 16, verse 30. But Ahab, son of Omri, did what was evil in the Lord's sight, more than all who were before him. It got worse and worse and worse. I'm not a prophet nor son of a prophet, but we can kind of see maybe some similar things going on today, can we not? So Ahab was worse than all who were before him. To make matters worse, Ahab married Jezebel, the daughter of a pagan king. And they together brought in the worship of Baal to the nation. So we have here uh, Elijah coming on the scene in, in chapter 17. Now, um, one thing that I've learned, and the students have helped me out with this, is that uh, Facebook, we, you know, we use Facebook, we keep up with things, you know, it's a great way to promote our own selfish pride and, and things, and you know, we put pictures of our food that we're eating, we tell them what we're doing. It's just a fantastic invention, is it not? So let's just pretend here that Elijah, he, 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 we're scrolling through his uh, timeline, all right? So Elijah's uh, Facebook timeline looks something like this. Hey, in just a little bit, I'm gonna meet with the king. We appreciate your prayers. Okay, we scroll down a little bit further. Uh, Hey, I'm packing up and moving to a cave. (laughs) Hashtag no food. (laughs) The next thing on his timeline, he gets a little picture of a raven. It's like, hey, check out what the ravens brought me today. Uh, another timeline uh, post. Hey, getting ready to pack up. Move to a lady's house with her son. If anybody's available at 8 a.m., I need some help packing the moving truck. Scroll a little bit further. Man, I just saw God raise this lady's son from the dead. Hey, I've got an important meeting coming up with the king. I'd appreciate your prayers. 
you see, Elijah in chapter 17 says, Elijah the Tishbite. And that may mean nothing. It means nothing to me other than the fact that he was not a Hebrew. Elijah was not one of the tribes of Israel, but God used Elijah in a mighty, mighty way. So he is uh, an outsider coming into the nation of Israel as a prophet. And he, apo- he appears and he talks to uh, the king. And he said, Ahab, as the Lord of God of Israel lives, I stand before him and there will be no dew or rain during these years except by my command. So Elijah announces that there's going to be a severe drought of famine. He said, it won't rain again until I say that it will. Uh, then a revelation from the Lord came to him. Leave here, turn eastward, and hide yourself in the wadi. That's where he went to the cave. God provided the ravens. He provided the springs to feed and nourish Elijah while he's there. The spring dries up. God calls Elijah to go to the widow's house to stay with her. Really cool story there in chapter 17. He goes to the gate and he says, hey, I need something to eat. And she's like, hey, this is all I've got. I've got this little jar of flour. It's all I got, a little bit of oil. Me and my son, I'm trying to make some food before we die because of the drought and the famine. And Elijah's pleading with her, please just give me something to eat. So the lady says, okay, I'll make you something to eat. And that jar of flour and that oil never ran dry. They ate many, many days, the Bible says. God provided them for them in a very special way. Now, chapter 18. Let's actually get to the story. Okay, that's the context. So we've got the nation of Israel. They are um, under poor leadership, suffering from the idea that there is no God, that these Baals and the, and the God of these pagans are the ones that we should be worshiping. And then we have Elijah plopping onto the scene. Chapter 18. After a long time, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. I'm going to get, guys, I'll get to the actual verse of the, lesson, or the message here in just a minute. The word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year. Go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain to the service of the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. You see here uh, a man named Obadiah gets brought into this story. See, Obadiah was, he served under King Ahab, the wickedest king of Israel to date. But he feared God. He loved God. And so what Obadiah did was he went and he helped hide prophets in the caves. So Elijah goes to Obadiah and says, hey, I got to talk to King Ahab. And Obadiah says, "Uh uh-uh, no way. There's no way that I'm going to Ahab to say, hey, Elijah needs to talk to you because Elijah or the king has sent me, Obadiah, out into all the land to search for you. And I've gone back time and time again. They're nowhere to be found. I think they're dead. I think the drought and famine have killed them. There's no way that I'm going to King Ahab to tell him that you want to talk to him because it's my life on the line. Elijah continues, please go get King Ahab. I must speak to him. Oh, but I says, listen, I know you're one of these prophets. What if I go and get King Ahab and I bring him back and the spirit of the Lord is taking you out and you're no longer there? Guess what? It's going to be my head. But Obadiah was obedient. He goes, he gets King Ahab. And now we pick up the story. Today's message is inside of the showdown on Mount Carmel. No, that is not the next drink at Starbucks Frappuccino. It is, although it would be a great name for one, it's the showdown at Mount Carmel. Let's pick it up in chapter 18, verse 17. Obadiah, or 16, Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him. Then Ahab went to meet Elijah. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, is that you, you destroyer of Israel? It's a funny question coming from the king who was the worst than all the rest. Is that you, the destroyer of Israel? Verse 18, he replied, I have not destroyed Israel, but you and your father's house have because you have abandoned the Lord's commands and followed the Baals. Now summon all Israel to meet me at Mount Carmel along with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Now, mind you, King Ahab, wicked king, sees Elijah, a prophet of God. He could have snapped his fingers and Elijah is done and over with. There's no more Elijah. But God protected Elijah and God gave this little bit of doubt, maybe in Ahab, to say, let's see what this is all about. Verse 20. So Ahab summoned all the Israelites and gathered the prophets at Mount Carmel. Then Elijah approached all the people and said, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If Yahweh is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. 
Then Elijah said to the people, I am the only remaining prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us. They are to choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces and place it on the wood and not light the fire. I will prepare the other bull and place it on the wood but not light the fire. Then you call in the name of your God and I will call in the name of Yahweh. The God who answers the fire, he is God. All the people answered, that sounds about good. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, since you are so numerous, choose for yourselves one bull and you go first. Then call in the name of your God but don't light the fire. So they took the bull all right, next uh, post on uh, Elijah's timeline. Hey, we've got a barbecue coming up on Mount Carmel. Bring the Coke and the Cheetos. So they took the bull that he gave them, prepared it, called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, Baal, answer us. But there was no sound. No one answered. Then they danced, hobbling around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah mocked them. He said, shout loudly, for he, he's a god. Maybe he's thinking it over. Maybe he has wandered away. Or maybe he's on... The road. I love Elijah. Elijah, Elijah is, uh, he's, he's my kind of guy. Elijah is sitting there. He's drinking his Coke or sweet tea and Cheetos, watching all of this unfold, watching all of this unfold. These people dancing around, shouting loudly. And at noon, he's ready to up the ante just a little bit. And he says, Hey, maybe he's, maybe he's just thinking it over. And so Elijah is, is humanizing the gods of Baal. He's just got to think about it. The scriptures are actually very kind uh, to how they record this next little bit because he says maybe he has wandered away. In the, in the Hebrew text, basically Elijah is saying maybe he's using the restroom or maybe he's on the road. Perhaps he's sleeping and he will wake up. And then they shouted louder. And then they cut themselves with knives and spears. And he's probably thinking to himself, wow, I didn't really expect that. Like, that's crazy. <laughs> Until blood gushed all over them. Verse 29. All afternoon they kept on raving until the offering of the evening sac sacrifice. But there was no sound. And no one answered. And no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near me. So all the people approached him. Then he repaired the Lord's altar that had been torn down. Remember, Elijah is not uh, of one of the tribes of Israel. But Elijah took 12 stones. And Elijah was very uh, poignant about what he did because the nation is divided. He's trying to bring about a remembrance of, uh, of their understanding of who Yahweh is. And he takes the 12 stones and he makes an altar according to the, to the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come. And he built an altar with the stones in the name of Yahweh. Then he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold about four gallons. Next, he arranged the wood, cut up the bowl, placed it on the wood, and he said, fill four, pots of water with wa fill four water pots with water and pour it on the offering to be burned and on the wood. Then he said a second time, and they did it a second time. Then he said a third time, and they did it a third time. So the water ran all over the altar. He even filled the trench with water. Who does that, Right? Like, okay, let's, let's have this little test, a little showdown here. Let's see. But Elijah just takes it one step further. At the time of the offering of the eating sacrifice, Elijah the prophet approached the altar and said, Yahweh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and that at your word I have done all these things. Answer me, Lord, answer me so that this people will know that you, Yahweh, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. It's a great place to end the story, right? <laughs> oh, well, we should read on. Then, then, Yahweh's fire fell, consumed the burnt offering, the wood, the stones, and the dust, and it licked up every bit of water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell face down and said, Yahweh, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. The next part of the story is a part of the story that we don't often like to read, unless you're a man. Then Elijah ordered them, seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized him, and Elijah brought them down to the wadi, slaughtered them there. And listen, this is the perfect foreshadowing. 
Elijah said to King Ahab, King Ahab has been watching this whole thing go down. He has been watching all these events transpire of the day. He's watched Yahweh's fire fall and just take care of everything that was on that altar. And I could just see Elijah look at the king and say, go eat and drink and be merry because the, th- the sound of a thunderstorm is in the near future. I love Elijah. I love how he just, man, he hits him right between the eyes. There's three things I want to share with you this morning. Sometimes standing up means you might be standing alone. Sometimes standing up means that you may be standing alone. You see Elijah, one Versus 850 prophets, I'm sure there was a whole host of people who were watching, anticipating that one remaining prophet would just ride off into the sunset. Some of you are in families where you are the only believer. Some of you work in a job at your lunch table, at the coffee table, whatever it may be, you are the only believer. And sometimes, you have to stand up, and you know that when you stand up, you're standing alone. In the midst of worship, you're moved by the Spirit. In honor of God, I'm going to stand up, but when you stand up, you run the risk of being the only one standing up. God never intended you to stand alone. That's why the church is important. We can stand together as a body to support one another, to encourage one another, to pray for one another. God never encouraged us to be alone. In fact, he says, it's it's better that two are together. In fact, even better than that, a cord of three cannot easily be broken. But sometimes we find ourselves alone, standing alone. We have circumstances, we have situations in our life, in our work, but we're the only one. Some of us have been stricken with fear. Some of us have not been willing to be that one person who stands up because we fear that we might be the only one standing up. Elijah stood up. There was great confidence in Elijah, and really that brings me to point number two. Be fearless with those things that you know to be true. Be fearless with those things you know to be true. You see, Satan wants nothing more than you to feel like you're the only one. He wants to isolate you. He wants to do his best to isolate you so you're the only one. You've got no one that has your back. He wants you to believe you can't do it. But Elijah was completely fearless. His life could have been taken like that. But he stood in the presence. One Versus 850 prophets and a whole host of other people there on Mount Carmel. The Mediterranean Sea in the background. He's standing alone. And with great confidence, Elijah approached all the people in verse 21 and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If Yahweh is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people didn't answer him A word, he was completely fearless. I didn't even have to look that word up in the dictionary to know what that word means. Without fear. Let me give you an example. A couple of years ago, a few years ago, our son, Cooper, uh, we're all in the backyard playing as a family. And Cooper runs inside, which was not abnormal at the time, to what I assume to get a juice box or something. And it's not a few moments later that we're in the backyard and we hear the doorbell ring, which is abnormal this day and age to hear your doorbell ring. No one just shows up and rings the doorbell unless it's bad news. The doorbell rings. So we go and we answer the door and this very kind, very gentle uh, woman has our son who I think maybe just had a diaper on and says, listen, I get it, I have sons of myself. I have sons myself. But your son was down uh, in playing in the road doing what appeared to be karate moves. (laughs) Just get that image in your head. 
So as the Spirit of God fell upon me, and I ever so gently carried my son up to his room to discuss the events that had just taken place. In the most God-honoring, loving, passionate way, I say to him, what were you thinking? Cooper, don't you know that those cars are driving? You are this tall, they are this tall, they can't see you and they can smash you. They can kill you. They can hurt you. He says, Daddy, I would just stop them with my superpowers. <laughs> you just, there are times when you are completely speechless as a parent. Sometimes you're laughing hysterically. Sometimes you're so mad you don't know what to say. Sometimes you're just speechless. That was one of those moments. I was just speechless. I don't know what to say to that. We taught him to be a man. Man, you have superpowers. Man, be a superhero. Daddy, I'll just stop him. I said, no, buddy, those superpowers, they can't stop a car. He's like, okay, well, I'll just jump over them when they come. <laughs> completely, completely fearless. He had no knowledge of the dangers that could come. And even if he did, he didn't care because he felt like he could stop the car moving at 45 miles an hour. Maybe it's fearless like Michael Mansour did last week at camp. Uh, Clayton King shared this story of Michael Mansour. He's a Navy SEAL. <clears throat> he was fighting in Iraq, and he went to set up a sniper post on top of a building. He and seven other brothers, Navy SEALs. And as they were setting up their perimeter to take out some insurgents, a hand grenade comes flying into the building. And Michael Mansour exhibited the greatest display of fearlessness that one could, he jumped on the grenade to protect the rest of his team. He was killed instantly, obviously. But by his act of fearlessness, he saved the other Navy SEAL team members. When I think about missionaries, Chris and Hannah Greenwood, and they, are, they get faced with situations and questions. How are you going to live? How are you going to eat? How are you going to work? Fearless. Reckless, abandoned, heading to know, to do what they know to be true. You remember not so long ago, the 21 Egyptian Christians who were beheaded by ISIS. You remember seeing that on the news. I did some reading. So there's 20 of them that were named as martyrs in the Coptic church there in Egypt. 20. Oh, didn't you say there's 21 beheaded? Yeah. So the story about the 21st guy, his name is Matthew. Matthew was a non-Christian. Matthew didn't believe in God. But throughout that whole ordeal, he saw 20 of his closest friends who were not willing to recant the name of Jesus Christ. And he said at his death, their God is my God. Completely fearless of what they knew to be true. Well, you ask, what do we know to be true? Let's start with the gospel of Jesus Christ. God created this world. He created man. He looked at man and said, it was good. It's very good. Man was led away and tempted. And sin entered this world. There's only one way for God to redeem his people because of the separation that exists between God and man because of the sin in the world. And that was his only son, Jesus Christ, who came and lived a perfect life. He was tempted in every way, yet he did not sin. They hung him on a cross. He willingly laid down his life on a cross for your sin. He paid the penalty for your sin. They put him in a grave. But the grave couldn't hold him. It's three days later, he showed up. He ascended to heaven where he sits at the right hand of God. And one day he's coming back. Church, we have the message of the gospel. We have the good news. There are people right across this street who are dying and going to hell. And we have the message of hope that they need. 
Elijah was not concerned about the numbers. Elijah was not concerned about what people thought about him. Elijah was completely fearless, and he walked up to all those prophets and said, if God is Yahweh, if Baal is is God, then worship him, but if Yahweh is God, let's worship him. I'm here to tell you that Yahweh is God. Jesus Christ is Lord. And with fearlessness, we should go out and we should tell the people that we see in our workplaces, in our families, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, Jesus is Lord, and let me tell you what he's done for me. Complete and utter fearlessness. Man, I've already gone over. The third thing, recognize who you are for your benefit and others around you. I'll talk fast. Recognize who you are for your benefit and others. You see, Uh, Elijah, when he prayed, he says, at the time of the offering of eating sacrifice, Elijah the prophet approached the altar and said, Yahweh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and I am your servant. He knew who he was. I am God's servant. My wife is a counselor and she works with young people and old people. And there is an identity crisis, church. There's an identity crisis that we have young people and adults and college students growing up and they don't know who they are. They're trying so hard to fit into the world around them that they don't know who they are. And they're stuck being pulled this direction. They're stuck being pulled this direction. They don't know who they are. I got, I got messed up when I read this quote. And please hear, I'm, I'm the chief one guilty of this. The quote says something like this. It says, we have to begin to make our children and our grandchildren the object of our faith rather than the extension of our ego. As you look at your children and grandchildren's life, their book of life, May Christianity and their faith not be just a footnote. May it be the front page. May it be the back page. May it be every page in between because you, as parents and grandparents, are investing everything you possibly can into the faith of your children and grandchildren. That will help them know who they are. And when they're being pulled in this direction and that direction, they can stand firm and say, I am God's and I am no other. The world looks at me and they see a grandson of Gilbert and Mary Catherine O'Dell and Delbert and Donna Shea. They see a son of Les and Deborah O'Dell, a brother to Brian O'Dell, a husband to Nikki O'Dell, a father to Laney and Cooper, an, un- an uncle to lots of nieces and nephews. I work at a church. I have a master's degree by the grace of God. (laughs) But if you were to strip all of that away from me, all of that was stripped away, I have to know that I'm a child of God's. And that's all that matters because there's gonna come a day when everything is stripped away. There's gonna be nothing left, no matter wealth, no matter houses, no matter cars, no amount of anything is going to matter except you being called a child of God. Elijah knew who he was. Do you think Elijah was blessed on that mount? Absolutely. He was blown away. Do you think a lot of other people who are watching were blown away as well? You see, when you get it, when you can live in the confidence of who I am, and you can move forward in the midst of adversity and struggles and problems and everything else, when you can move with great boldness forward in that, other people are watching, and other people are like, man, I want what they got. Our students, our children, our preschoolers, they need parents to step up to say, this is who I am and this is where we're going. With great fearlessness, we are moving forward in this direction because it's what God's called us to do. These young people, some of them have parents that could care less. 
Some of them have parents that care very much. They need the church. The church, church, you need them. I pray that we will be fearless. Like Elijah standing in the midst of 850 men with great boldness to see God reveal himself. You see, God wants to show himself to you. It may not mean an altar, a fire, but he is in constant pursuit of you. He wants your heart. He wants every fiber of your being. There's a world all around this campus. It's far from God. They may have never heard the gospel message. There may be people who have never had anyone tell them, I love you. May we be a church that with fearlessness moves forward in this community, in the next community, and across the world into Canada. Share God's love with people. Just a moment, I'm gonna pray. Now I'm gonna ask the band to begin to move forward. The invitation is pretty simple. God is in pursuit of you. God wants to reveal himself to you. God wants to do something amazing through you. I'm just asking, will you respond? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for this amazing story of Elijah. God, how you revealed yourself in such a mighty and huge way. And Lord, we may not see an altar consumed with fire that's been soaked water. But this past week, I saw students' lives transformed who were destined for hell, damnation, transferred and transformed, and you gave them a new path. You gave them a new name. You set them on a new course, and they have an eternal life with you now. God, you revealed yourself in a huge way to our people. So God, this morning, we're asking that as you are working in our lives, and God, maybe there's sin in our lives, and maybe there's some things that we've done wrong, but we know that that does not affect your love for us. The Bible says nothing can separate us from your love. And so God, I pray Lord, that with fearlessness, if we need to, we'll come to this altar. We'll lay it before you. Let you deal with our lives. God, maybe there's one who's never heard the gospel message. They've never heard the good news that you provided the perfect sacrifice for them so that they would not have to die in their sins and trespasses, but you provided that perfect sacrifice and you can transfer them from death to life. Maybe, maybe you're reaching out to them this morning, God, and I pray, Lord, that they would respond to that gospel message. Lord, whatever the case may be, we're here. We're listening and we're open and we're willing, Lord, to respond. And so, church, I pray, Lord, that we'll respond. We pray these things in Jesus' name.